equate Professor Ramji to uh, room air resuscitation, uh, and uh, and I'm sure that uh, Dr. Ramji relates uh, Professor Ola for the research work uh, in resuscitation as well as uh, other field. So over to you, Dr. Ramji. Uh, thank you, Srinivas. It's uh, in fact a really great pleasure for me to be chairing this session uh, uh, where Professor Ola Sokstad is <clears throat> going to deliver this talk this uh, evening. Of course, uh, we have a very long association of more than three decades and uh, uh, it's been a very wonderful journey. But more importantly, I think you need to understand uh, that Professor Sogstar uh, not only has uh, he contributed to resuscitation, but he has contributed immensely to several, several things that have happened, including surfactant therapy in neonates. But most important than that, uh, you know, is the fact that he has traveled very widely, uh, not only in the developed countries, but also in low and middle income countries and has a very good sense of uh, the kind of problems that we experience, the challenges that we experience, uh, um, which are very different from what happens in the Scandinavian nations or in, in the European and other American nations. And it is this uh, ability for him to look at and straddle this width of uh, and variation in the kind of uh, populations, the kind of uh, problems people face that brings them the capacity to actually critically give an insight into what can happen and uh, where he can put his science. He has, he has years and years of wonderful research experience. I, uh, my early days of resuscitation began by working for some time, spending some time in his lab. And so it's really wonderful. Today, he's going to talk on a, a topic uh, which is very important, uh, something that we are grappling with every day. Um, how do we bring down uh, neonatal mortalities in countries like ours? Of course, India has made tremendous progress uh, over the many years. Uh, unlike some of the other countries, India was one of the earliest countries in the low and middle income countries, which actually initiated a dedicated newborn survival program. And, uh, and as a result of which we have gone greatly ahead, India has also innovated. But I think today what he's going to bring uh, to this webinar is his experience from all other countries and his perspective of what we all can do in order to improve newborn survival. So Ola, it's a great pleasure for me to ask you to deliver this uh, evening's uh, lecture and the webinar. Over to you, Ola. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, um, Siddharth, for this introduction. I would like to thank for, for the invitation also and for the introduction by uh, Dr. Murski. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I feel a little bit humble um, talking about this uh, topic uh, for you because you, you know more about this than, um, than I do, but um, I'm just sharing my screen. Do you see it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, but I, I may have one advantage, and that is uh, that I have uh, <clears throat> traveled widely to many uh, countries around the world. And uh, just a year ago, I was in, in Delhi. And uh, here you see we, have, we visited uh, Lady Harding Medical College. Here is Dr. Sushma, um, head of the milk bank. And uh, this is me. This is my favorite place in the world, Taj Mahal. I've been there six times. Every time I go to Delhi, I go to Taj Mahal. And, and I, I love it. Um, <clears throat> so um, thank you. Also, I would thank you, Dr. Vera, also for, for inviting me and organizing uh, this uh, lecture. So um, 10 years ago, I, I published this article, Reducing Global Neonatal Mortality is Possible, 
And I think that is uh, maybe one reason I, I was invited to give this uh, lecture uh, tonight. And I also presented some recommendations how to reduce uh, newborn mor mortality, 10 commandments. I'll come back to that at the end of my lecture. This is um, an outline of what I was planning to talk about. <clears throat> I will give you some background uh, information which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, but still I think it's important to update where we are. Um, how has uh, morbidity and mortality developed the recent years? And then I will uh, talk about um, effective interventions. I will sh show you some examples, first from my own country, but also from other countries. How neonatal and infant mortality has been decreased uh, the last decades. I think it's important to learn from others. And I will um, also, at the end, I will talk about uh, a project I have been doing in, in West Africa, in Mali, a Helping Babies Breed program. Stillbirths, I don't think I have, have uh, time to talk about stillbirths uh, today. Uh, but I, I just would like to put it on the agenda and, and say a few words about it, and I will end up with some suggestions. So as um, all of you know, there has been a lot of programs uh, from the WHO, UNICEF, um, <clears throat> how to reduce uh, newborn mortality and morbidity globally. So here are some examples, essential newborn care, making every baby count. And um, this is uh, just a uh, um, slide showing how many lives uh, it's potentially possible to, to save uh, within 2025. And you see here preconception, nutritional care, is important pregnancy care, but most important is care during labor, er, around birth and in the first week of life, but also care of small and sick newborn babies. <clears throat> so according to UNICEF uh, some years ago, 2.6 million newborns die every year. But all of us know, we know that we have to interpret these numbers with caution um, because um, we know that the, the data, the source of the data very often are secondary. And this is something I face during my project in, in West Africa. It's hard to get uh, data uh, which you really can trust. <clears throat> well, one only a quarter of the world's population lives in countries where more than 90% of births and deaths are registered. So this uh, illustrates the imbalance between deaths between countries in the world. Here are, are the most recent uh, facts from WHO, which I will present for you as some background. Who is at most risk? Well, <clears throat> there has been a substantial reduction in neonatal and child mortality the last 30 years. So for instance, newborn neonatal deaths have been reduced by 50% from five to 2.4 million during 30 years. But what is important for us who are neonatologists is that the decline in neonatal mortality during these 30 years has been slower than that of post-neonatal under five mortality. So um, three-fourths, 75% of the neonatal deaths occurs during the first week of life and approximately 1 million die within the first 24 hours. And what I think is important um, is that 
to know that what are the most important causes of death in the neonatal period. And I'm sure all of you know that it's uh, so-called uh, interpartum related complications, which are previously called birth asphyxia, preterm birth infections and congenital uh, anomalies. It has been shown that um, women who receive um, midwife-led continuity of care, and this should be provided by professional midwives, they have a 16% reduction in the likelihood to lose their baby and a 24% reduction in chance of having a preterm birth. So this is also important um, where and how the delivery is carried out. So this is um, <clears throat> the most important cause of mortality. Um, it is preterm birth. See here, and get this here. And then interpartum related events, birth asphyxia, one fourth and neonatal infections, a little bit more than uh, one quarter. So these are the three top killers of newborns, prematurity, infections, and birth asphyxia. Well, here's the top 10 list of newborn deaths. And um, um, of course, it's not so nice to be on this list. And India is still high on the list. And the reason for that is, of course, that you have such a vast uh, population. I will, I will show you um, within some minutes um, that India has improved uh, quite uh, fantastic uh, regarding mortality in the recent years. So um, according to WHO and UNICEF, uh, um, there are five important steps we can take. First, it's to invest in maternal and newborn care during labor, birth, and the first week of life. To improve the quality of maternal and newborn care, reaching every woman a newborn to reduce inequalities, and harnessing the power of parents, families, and communities. And finally, counting every newborn with measurement, program tracking, and accountability. We have to know, in order to improve, we have to know how many babies are born, how many babies survive, how many babies die, and how many babies have complications. And you see, this is very cheap. Only $1 plus per person. So here's another way to illustrate that, these five steps. Um, it's also important to be aware of, of danger signs. So you could educate the, the parents, for instance, uh, so that they could identify as soon as possible um, those babies who need extra care, need to go to health facilities um, or have to stay longer in health facilities after delivery. And if a newborn is identified as sick when they're home, the family should be helped in locating a hospital or a facility to take care of, of the baby. And of course, there's special guidelines for HIV infected mothers. So I will not spend time on that here. So <clears throat> according to World Health Organization, 30 million babies are born too soon, too small, or become sick and are at the greatest risk of death or disability. We can change this. And I think that is absolutely true. So if you look at these uh, four major causes of death in newborn, um, we see that if we look at infections in the world, it's causing 27% of the mortalities. In Europe, it's less than half. Prematurity is the same. But asphyxia is lower in Europe than in the world. Congenital malformation percent-wise is higher in Europe uh, than in the rest of the world. 
So let's say a few words about low weight, low birth weight and prematurity. It has been estimated that 20 million low birth weight newborns are delivered every year out of 130, approximately 130, 135 million newborns. And most of these are in low income countries, 95%. And it's a wide variation from five to 30%. And it doesn't seem to decrease. And that is of course uh, concerning. Regarding the prematurity rate, it's approximately 10%, 10, 11%, 15 million. And again, there is a very wide range from 5% in some high income countries to 18% in low income countries. And prematurity rate is, is increasing and that is also concerning and more than 1 million preterm babies die every year so well this is um, just um, another way to phrase this um, three quarter of these deaths could be prevented with the current cost effective interventions and uh, yeah so this is what i mentioned so what is important is to locate a hospital or facility to care for the baby, keep the newborn warm. That includes skin to skin care, assistance with the initiation of breastfeeding, extra attention to hygiene, especially hand washing, and extra attention to danger signs and need for care and additional support for breastfeeding. And it is important, of course, to monitor growth. Yeah, so this is, um, I think, what I mentioned already. Uh, essential care um, should um, include antenatal steroids, kangaroo mother care, frequent breastfeeding, and antibiotics to treat uh, uh, infections and uh, infections. And then a few words about um, prenatal asphyxia. Ninety-six percent of death from perinatal asphyxia occurs in low and middle income countries. And the mortality rate due to perinatal asphyxia is 20 to 50 fold higher in the lowest compared to the highest income countries. Now, the most recent uh, numbers I have seen is that approximately 700,000 children die every year due to perinatal asphyxia, but it's down from 1 million in the end of the 1990s, around year 2000. So there has been a substantial progress, but in addition, of course, we have a lot of uh, babies with sequels, um, 1 million estimated, who develop cerebral palsy, learning difficulties, or other disabilities. And again, um, the incidence in high income countries is much lower than in low income countries. You see it is tenfold higher in low income countries. So this is um, a diagram made by Gapminder. It's went, invented by Hans Rosling, who unfortunately passed away some years ago, but it, it il illustrates here we have the gross domestic product per capita on the X axis. And here we have deaths for birth asphyxia on the y-axis. And you see there's a linear relation between death and gross domestic capita, or it's inverse relation. <coughs> so those the high income countries have less. So <coughs> when you're looking at this uh, graph, uh, it is tempting to say that maybe the most important job in order to reduce neonatal mortality is to be a politician, to increase a gross domestic product. Uh, a few words about resuscitation. See that mentioned uh, resuscitation, mm -hmm. and I have to talk about that. This is how the word map looked like until 1998 regarding newborn recitation and the use of oxygen. All guidelines, as I'm aware of, 
they recommended <clears throat> to use 100% <clears throat> oxygen. So <clears throat> at that time, babies who were resuscitated, <clears throat> excuse me, they, they had this enormous PO2 peak here, very toxic. We know today this is a toxic PO2 peak. In some countries, or maybe many countries where oxygen was not available, babies were not even tried to be resuscitated because everybody believed that you need oxygen in order to resuscitate newborn babies. Now, <clears throat> this is a meta-analysis. Uh, Ramji and I, together with Max Vento and Roger Saul, published in 2008, where we summarized all the 10 studies which had been published in this field, where babies had been randomized or pseudo-randomized to recitation with air versus 100% oxygen. You see the first study here was, came from Delhi, Siddharth Ramji. That was a very brave step, um, the first pilot study we published in 1993. And we started to plan this study, I think, two years ahead. And I know there was a lot of resistance also in, in India um, at that time. This uh, meta-analysis uh, shows, and uh, this has been uh, confirmed by several other meta-analysis, it shows that uh, mortality is reduced approximately 30% when uh, <clears throat> babies are resuscitated with air instead of oxygen. So we estimated at that time that uh, more than 200,000 newborn lives can be saved just by switching from 100% oxygen to 21% oxygen. So in 2010, international guidelines changed from oxygen to air, and the world map look, looks like this. Now, as far as I know, guidelines now recommend to start with air for term or near-term babies. So in, in addition to 200, 250,000 saved lives by avoiding the toxic the hyperoxic peak. Here you can see that if you resuscitate with, with air, you get this more physiological normalization of PO2. In addition, approximately 300,000 fresh stillbirths can be saved by applying positive pressure ventilation with air. So that adds up to half a million. Just a few words about neonatal infections. More than 1 million newborns die of infection each year. And we know that most of these occur in the late neonatal period. And we also know that preterm births are associated with ur urinary tract or genital um, infections. And often they are asymptomatic. As far as I know, there's still conflicting results regarding use of antibiotic in order to prevent premature labor. And just one slide about congenital anomalies. That's been estimated that 300,000 newborns die each year due to congenital anomalies. And as you all know, this, this may contribute to long-term disability which may have significant impacts, not only on the individual with the anomaly, but also the families, the healthcare system and, and the society. And here are the most common congenital anomalies globally, heart defects, neural tube defects and Down syndrome. Uh, <clears throat> and it's sometimes difficult to identify <clears throat> the exact causes. But what I would like to emphasize is that some of these may be prevented by vaccination, intake of folic acid, iodine, fortification of food and supplementation, and adequate antenatal care. So this was a little bit background, and now I'll talk about interventions. So if you look here at um, 
neonatal mortality, we see that there has been a dramatic reduction in neonatal mortality globally from 1990, when Siddharth and I, approximately at the time when Siddharth and I met first time, 36 per thousand. And now today it's half 18 per thousand. So, so what, what are the causes? Why have we obtained these results? Well, um, together, um, yeah, well, it has, of course, there have been some interventions. And, and some years ago, these authors mentioned here, Ayers and Barros and co-workers, they had listed some interventions. They, they felt were of importance for low and middle income countries. Antenatal steroids in preterm labor, antibiotics for premature rupture of membranes, vitamin K, handling of neonatal sepsis, pneumonia, delayed cord clamping. At that time, 10 years ago, it was not so hot as it is today. <clears throat> and I was very pleased to see that they had added room air visitation instead of 100% oxygen on this list. Kangaroo mother care, early breastfeeding, terminal care, surfactant therapy, and CPAP. And so I put an asterisk for all these um, interventions that are of special importance for preterm babies. And now I'll show you what happened in Norway, because I think we can learn from also from Norway. And here is the infant mortality rate in Norway from 1911 till 1990. And you see there's a steady decline from 80 per thousand down here to less than <clears throat> 15 per thousand. And it's hard to demonstrate any interventions that were important. But we know that in 1940, approximately 1940, hospital deliveries became more common. Antenatal care was introduced. <clears throat> and um, in the mid 60s, infant mortality was less than 15 per thousand. Why is this of interest? It is interesting because neonatal intensive care was introduced in Norway 10 years later in the 70s. And this indicates that neonatal or an infant mortality can be substantially decreased without high technology. And this has been shown in other countries also. So based on this, I uh, suggested that global neonatal mortality can be reduced from at that time, it was close to 30 per thousand till less than 15 per thousand without, without high technology intervention. I think this is an important message to low and middle income countries because many say we don't have, we don't have, we cannot afford this um, um, uh, high technology um, equipments. Two million can be saved at that time, just uh, without high tech. A further reduction to five per thousand, which I think should be a, the goal for every country in the world, that would require some technology and one more million could be saved. Five years ago, we published a, a study from Norway where we looked at which interventions have been most important for the reduction in neonatal mortality the last 50 years. Our birth registry started in 1967. So we, we have registered from 1967, and this is to up to <coughs> 2012. And here we have different uh, weight groups. Here's less than 1,000. Here's between 1,000 and 1,500 grams, 1,500 to 2,005 and about 2,005 and all, all weight groups. The red line represents the drop in mortality the first year, infant mortality. And the dotted blue line represents how the mortality has decreased uh, the first week. <clears throat> and you see that in all weight groups, maybe especially this smallest one, there's been a dramatic decrease in mortality. 
Now, I did this study with some health economists and they asked me to make a list of <clears throat> the most important interventions that had been introduced in this time period from 1967 up to 2012. And here is my list and I will not go through that in detail. And, and then we asked the hospitals, when did you use this, this, this intervention? And based on that, they could calculate which intervention was most important during this time period. And they were able to identify four interventions <coughs> that were responsible for approximately 50% of the reduction in mortality. First of all, ventilators, antenatal steroids, surfactant, and to some extent, insure and CPAP. Although the bold numbers here means that this is significant. So <clears throat> ventilators had an effect on all weight groups, most up to 2,500 gram, antenatal steroids up to 1,500 grams, surfactant also up to 1,500 grams, and this is of course not a surprise, insure CPAP mostly for babies less than 1,000 grams. So antenatal steroids and surfactant were the most important intervention. I don't, I don't think that is a surprise to any neonatologist. And here, this is a <coughs> busy slide. Uh, but if you look at this um, light blue lines here, these are how the mortality was influenced by intervention. And again, we have weight groups, 1,000 gram and less, 1,000 to 1,500 grams, 1,500 to 2,500 and above. And you see here, if you look here, if there was no intervention, the blue line, there was hardly any reduction in mortality. But with this intervention, you see how dramatic mortality has decreased also for all babies. But you see here, the, this um, heavy blue line, means that if there was no intervention, there wouldn't have been much, or <laughs> probably no reduction in mortality in Norway during these years. So four interventions contributed to 50% of the decrease in neonatal mortality since 1967. And I think this is an important message. These are respirator, antenatal steroids, surfactant, and insure CPAP because it means that we can focus, when talking about high technology, we can focus on a few interventions that we know are most efficient. Other countries are following the same um, pattern as in Norway. This is from Turkey, which have had a dramatic drop in infant mortality the last uh, 25 years. You see the curve is <coughs> follows the same pattern as in Norway. But they started later and they were able to achieve a good result much faster than we did in Norway. And the reason for that was they introduced a central health plan, the centralized deliveries and care of newborns, education, trained personnel became very important. Also, they got some equipment. And in Turkey, they do a lot of research. There are very active in, in neonatal research and also drugs, medicine, um, <clears throat> to everyone who needed it was um, given freely. And here we have um, <clears throat> the recent um, data from India. And you see there has been a dramatic drop in neonatal mortality in your country. So if we go here in 19, approximately 1990, when when uh, Siddharth and I met first time, mortality was 60 per thousand. Now it's down to 21 per thousand. It's a very dramatic reduction. Some years ago, I was involved in a project in Chile to analyze the data uh, from, uh, from Chile because Chile had a, quite a dramatic reduction in neonatal mortality in the 90s. It <coughs> <clears throat> decreased from 8.3 in 1990 to 5.7 in 2000, and it dropped further to 5 per thousand 
in 2004. So uh, here I have picked out how mortality decreased for babies between 12 and 50 and 1500 grams. They had a 50% reduction in mortality. So what happened? Well, early 1990s, they got some new equipment, incubators, maybe some ventilators. In the, the mid 1990s, they got better staffing, more doctors, nurses, and they started training the education courses and they got some monitors for ECG, for instance. And in 19, and around 1998, surfactant was introduced. We don't, we cannot say that this is the cause of this very steep reduction in mortality here, but it could be. And another thing which happened in Chile during this decade was that the gap between rich and poor was lowered. And this was reflected in a lowered, uh, in lowered mortality rates, um, which is uh, illustrated here. So this is also important, showing how important role the politicians may have in order to reduce mortality. So <clears throat> based on these <coughs> results, I I changed my um, numbers a little bit. Uh, global neonatal mortality can be reduced from 18 to 1,000 to less than 15 per 1,000 without high technology intervention. And that's approximately, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that's approximately one, half a million newborns can be saved. And again, a reduction further to five per 1,000 would require more technology. In 2012, I was asked by WHO, together with a number of other so-called experts, and maybe some of you in the audience got the same question. They wanted us to send in three priorities, how to reduce neonatal mortality within 2025. So here, <clears throat> Here are my priorities. Focus on the leading cause of death and morbidity in newborns, prematurity, infections, asphyxia. Shown here. Reduce home deliveries. And then my third priority was education to girls. Well, I, I met a lot of resistance in my own country when I, I wrote about this, because in Norway, there was focus mainly on reproductive health and vaccination. And I said that uh, it's more, maybe more important to focus on, on girls um, because if girls get education, we know that their nutritional status is better. They have better infection control. This improves the mother's health. And this reduces <coughs> birth complications and all these three major causes of death. Um, I was therefore very pleased that uh, at the countdown conference in Johannesburg in 2015, education of girls was the top priority, <coughs> which is now is in, in my country uh, also. So in this article I wrote in 2010, 2011, uh, <clears throat> I picked out some countries which had been uh, quite successful in reducing neonatal infant and childhood mortality. You see here Bangladesh, although their mortality is quite high, they had been able to reduce it 50% from 1990 to 2010. Cuba, well, that's... Uh, story by itself because they are using very tough political means to reduce um, <clears throat> mortalities. Indonesia has also been successful. Malawi, one of the countries in Africa which had some success. Oman has been very successful in Portugal in Europe. Portugal had a very high mortality and is now one of the lowest. Sri Lanka has been successful. South Africa, you see, has been not any decrease, by the contrary, it was some, some increase and probably due to the HIV 
epitome there. So when I prepared for this lecture, I updated these numbers and you see that, well, Bangladesh is still reducing, maybe at a slower pace. Cuba, very good. Chile, still very good. Indonesia is improving. Malawi, Malawi also, Oman is doing excellent. And Portugal, Sri Lanka, and South Africa is also coming. Um, so I think what we have to do, we have to, to learn from these countries. Together with Jailon, we have tried to estimate the effect of the most important uh, interventions. For instance, antenatal steroids, we estimate that if this is widespread globally, half a million can be saved. So factant 250,000, ventilators 600,000, air recitation 250, plus the stillbirth, approximately half a million, kangaroo mother care 450,000, hypothermia therapy. Yeah, it's efficient, but not as efficient as the others, 40 to 80,000. And I compare that with oral rehydration, of course, not mainly to newborns, but you see that 2 million babies or infants can be saved by oral rehydration has been estimated. So I will just end up with um, showing some of our results from um, my project in Mali, in West Africa. So Mali is one of the poorest uh, countries in the world. It has a population, now it's 17 million. It, uh, some years ago it was 15 million. And uh, three, three million of these are under five. If you look at neonatal mortality, it was very high, 42 per thousand. And here we have the causes of under five deaths in uh, Mali. And it's the same distribution as I've shown before. It is infections, it's preterm birth, uh, and it's asphyxia, important uh, causes of delivery. And if, when you look at under five mortality rate here, we have this so-called um, countdown countries, 75 count countdown countries, Mali is at the bottom. And um, you see there is some progress, but it's uh, quite slow. And compared with other countries in uh, Africa, for instance, Tanzania, which is a country in East Africa, you see that the mortality rate is much, much higher. And also the neighboring country, Senegal, has lower mortality rates. So Mali is a, a country, a poor country with high mortalities. So what we did was that we introduced helping babies breed to Mali. And we started this project in 2015. And uh, Helping Babies Breed is based on uh, the golden minute that every baby should take its first breath within the first minute. And I'd like to emphasize that Helping Babies Breed is a, kind of a, a baby of room air recitation, because as long as babies were resuscitated with oxygen, uh, the Helping Babies Breed algorithm couldn't be followed. <clears throat> we know that up to 10% of babies would need ventilation help within one minute. Here is the algorithm, and you see it's pictorial, um, and I'm sure you all know it. As long as you're in the, the green area here, you can relax. Yellow, well, be a little bit worried, not crying, clear airways, etc. And if you are red here, it's uh, a danger sign. <clears throat> now we have uh, also gotten, uh, this is just to compare the Helping Babies Breed algorithm with uh, the ILCOR algorithm. I've not spent time on that. Uh, the second edition was um, published uh, some years ago. And um, what is different between Helping Babies Breed 1 and 2 is that in the second, you don't need to suction the airways routinely. Further, you should ventilate and then clamp and cut the cord. You should not cut the cord before you start ventilating and call for help, improve ventilation. <clears throat> and a lot of 
educational workshop is built into uh, helping babies breed principle. And uh, <clears throat> so this is just illustrating some of these workshops. Um, refreshment training is also important. That's also emphasized in the Helping Babies Breed Ring 2 algorithm. <coughs> so here is from um, one such uh, course. I have participated in several of these uh, courses. This is in San Francisco. This is Susan Niemeyer. Here I am. And here are some of the Norwegian my collaborators. Yeah. And here <coughs> we are having such a course in, in um, Mali. Uh, we have using mannequins and we recently published a study about our results from from one district in uh, in mali outside the capital bamako we published just uh, a year ago so the primary goal for us was to reduce mortality 30 percent from 42 to 28 per thousand and uh, that, that means that we could reduce 9,000 out of 28,000 annual deaths. So we trained 44 facilitators and master trainers. Now we have trained many, many more than that. 305 birth attendants at 32 health centers were trained. And we also trained <coughs> the staff at the local regional hospital. And <coughs> we tested their skills before and after. So max points in this test was 20 points. And you see before the training, 32% got less than 9%, nine points. Only 1% got this low score after. And a high score was 9% before and 64% after. So we think that the teaching has been had some effect. And here we see how this affects um, the recitation rate, the ventilatory rate. You see that more babies are now ventilated um, than before we introduced helping babies breed. And when you looked at uh, data from the regional hospital, um, mortality data, the perinatal mortality rate decreased more than 60%. Now, perinatal mortality rate is difficult to define because most of these babies and mothers, they, they leave the hospitals within six hours. We cannot follow them up more than six hours. Fresh stillbirth rate was decreased and also early neonatal mortality rate, which in our study was six hours, was also reduced. What we don't know is of course, if these data are sustainable. And we, unfortunately, we haven't been able to follow up these babies. So this is just another way to illustrate that. It's been a dramatic reduction in mortality from a very high level. And I just want to show you this um, because recently we published this in a recitation and asked the question, is the first golden minute relevant? Is it possible to achieve uh, to follow the algorithm of helping babies breed. So we looked at four studies, two from Tanzania, one from Uganda and one from Nepal. And you see that here in this study from Tanzania, babies were they started to ventilate, be ventilated after 134 seconds. That's two minutes. But in Uganda, they, they were very close and also in Nepal, very close. And this other study in, in Tanzania, a little bit slower, but you see that there's a wide variation, but it is possible to start ventilation within 60, 70 seconds, uh, I think in most cases. What happened here in this study is another story, uh, why it was so late. Okay, so I'm coming to the end. And um, as I said, I don't have time to talk about uh, stillbirth. Just want to remind you about this neglected tragedy. That could be another lecture. So I'll end up with my 10 commandments, how to reduce newborn mortality is based on, on these studies and, and my experience. And of course, you can uh, like to discuss this with you. 
But I think the most important is to learn from others, from countries which have been successful. Turkey, Portugal, Spain, Chile, Oman, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh. And I think the experience from India now uh, will be very important. We have to reorganize health services. We have to centralize when, when and where that is possible. I know that there are huge variations. And India, of course, it's, not, it's easy to come as a foreigner and say you have to centralize uh, when people are living out in the countryside. But, but uh, I know that many countries have had success in reorganization and centralizing the health cares. Educate girls, as I mentioned, early, easy access to antenatal care, hospital deliveries, breastfeeding, of course, and some basic equipment as incubators, uh, heart rate monitors, pulse oximeters, and then I think evidence-based treatment and guidelines are important. Also research. Turkey is a good example of that. And I think also national and international networks are so important. We can exchange ideas and experience with each other. And then I think every child who needs medicine should have it free. I think it's a shame that many parents cannot afford to, to buy medication to their child. I think it should be free. And I think that this is something we should really um, focus on as uh, neonatologists and doctors. So with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and you're all welcome to Norway. And for those who are interested in reading a little bit about this, I just published my biography, Fighting for Air, uh, and it's now coming out in Italian uh, next month. And it's also been translated to English. And for those of you who want to pre-order it, here is an email address. Thank you so much for your attention. And I will happy to try to answer questions and comments. So thank you so much, Ola. I mean, um, the overview that you have provided uh, has many lessons. Uh, clearly, uh, one of the things which you really said was uh, in most countries of the world, uh, reductions in neural hap mortality happened uh, even without technology coming in. Something else happened. Yeah. And uh, interestingly, uh, if you look at India, each of the states actually serves as a comparator to see how different interventions at different times have brought about a change. But I think the, the, the key for countries like ours is the ensuring equity. I think this is the biggest challenge. How do you bring equity to the large masses scattered across different strata, different terrain, different regions? Uh, equity is not only in terms of the ability to access healthcare, pay for it. It's also equity related to gender, the way the social cultural milieu treats women, uh, and uh, so it's it's a complex paradigm where I believe that uh, more than what we do within the health system is what you do in the social cultural context, education. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. and uh, how much you spend for all this and how, or how well you spend for all this. So I think the, 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 the uh, I think India has, uh, you, you will probably find each of your interventions that you've talked about is, has been in place in varying numbers in different parts of India. The key, the key is how do you saturate that all these interventions reach a threshold level, unless you get to a threshold level of the stakeholder population, the effects won't happen. Mm -hmm. And of course, the challenge for us also is that um, continued um, undernutrition in women and girl child over transgenerationally is going to take us some time to offset things like low birth weight uh, and preterm births, which, which are not always related to medical interventions. And that's a challenge that we are going to have. But I think the messages you have 
cut across uh, presented is important and I hope the audience understands that just working in Nikos is not enough to bring down mortalities at the country level. It may be good for individuals, we do that well, but I think we, as neonatologists, we also have a larger responsibility to ensure that uh, we contribute in our own way to ensure that uh, people we come across who are less privileged are able to benefit from um, our presence. Like for instance, if, if we were to ensure that uh, we could educate every girl of, a, of people who come and help us in our area of home or work, uh, maybe that's one change that we'll all bring eventually and the fact that they, they are with us will make a change. So thank you so much. And I hand it over to Dr. Srinivas to continue with uh, moderating. Thank you, sir. Thank you for those uh, excellent comments and also for uh, the wonderful talk, which has uh, really put in a uh, lot of uh, thought into the minds of people who have listened, what should be done for a country as a whole. Uh, but uh, I have some questions here, sir. Please, uh, uh, maybe uh, partly Dr. Professor Ola can answer and some Dr. Uh, Ramji can answer. Uh, the first question, as you rightly said, sir, there is a huge gap between the regions and between the societies. One important gap people realize now is in the public and private sector. So are there any lessons from the world or from our own country where this gap can be bridged? Yeah, I say, well, um, I cannot answer for India, but uh, I can answer for my own country. And I think one reason for our success in healthcare and many other um, areas is that we, we have a very egalitarian society. I mean, the difference between rich and poor is, is not so big as in many other countries. And that creates a solidarity. And uh, I think th this is important. But I, I would like to comment also what Siddharth said. I mean, clearly, you have been very successful in India. When you look at uh, how the mortality has decreased, Siddharth, it's been reduced from 60 per thousand when we met first time. And now it's 20. I mean, it's a success story. Uh, so you have done a lot of things right. But I think, uh, at least I felt my obligation in, in Norway is that not only I should not only be an ontologist, I should also inform the politicians. And I think that is what we can do. I mean, we can, we, we can help babies at an individual level in the NICU. But we also have to go out to the politicians and say, listen, you have to do this instead of that. And I can tell you, I became very unpopular because our prime minister, Mr. Stoltenberg, who many of you know, he had one vision, and that was he wanted to vaccinate every child in the world, which was a good I mean, intention. But I, I wrote in the paper and I, I said, this is uh, wrong priorities. We have to put more emphasis on newborn care and on, on um, pregnant women. And, and I became very unpopular in some circles because I, I, I said that, but uh, today I'm, I'm happy, I'm proud I did that. And I think that is our responsibility. We have to speak up against the politicians sometimes even. Sir, so, um Dr. Ramji. Yeah, so I think the, the issue in India is uh, the divide is uh, twofold. One, uh, that it's a question of even though you may want to go to a private hospital because of course you have a problem, uh, all, all public facilities do not necessarily match in terms of the, the availability of the type of care you need. So the answers to this lies in the fact that you need to you need to provide a social security to people, and I think that unfortunately India doesn't quite have the uh, an insurance a health in, uniform health insurance system. There are bits and pieces that have been happening, but I think the the current um, uh, paradigm, uh, the current effort by uh, the prime minister to bring about uh, a method where the Ayushman Bharat where you can cap pricing 
and you can ensure that people who are below the poverty line will not have to pay even if they get into the private sector. Maybe one beginning which will start addressing this issue. I'm not saying it'll solve, but I think these are some things that may eventually slowly start percolating and, and spread. Once it spreads large enough, we may. But remember, the, the social divide uh, is not easily solvable. And you can see that in some, some states, the divide is getting narrower, but in some it hasn't. And you know that's unfortunately the way it is because of the federal structure of uh, our country. But I think eventually we will move towards improving on that. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, there's one, one more question. Uh, Japan has an excellent neonatal outcome with respect to preterm care. Can these be extrapolated to low middle income countries? Professor Ola, would you like to take on that? Um, yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, of course, uh, Japan has very good results. I've been to Japan a couple of times and uh, seeing what they're doing. They're doing things a little bit differently than in Norway. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know the Japanese system good enough uh, to say how much of this can be transferred to, for instance, India. Um, so then I would m probably look to Oman or to Sri Lanka. Um, and I suggested to WHO uh, the time when I was more active there that they should have uh, groups of experts to, which could travel to countries and analyze the situation and give suggestions. Um, and I still think that's a good idea because sometimes when you're coming from the outside, it's easy to see structures which should be changed. I've been to countries, I was in Iran, for instance, and I saw that immediately, I saw that the private hospitals and the public hospitals were working in parallel. They didn't have any harmonization between them. And we had private hospitals with a few, one baby on the ventilator, for instance, didn't get any experience. It was so easy for me to see that this is not the optimal way to do it. But of course, it was very tricky because it's a political question. Uh, how many private hospitals you need and things like that. Um, so I still think that if um, we should have some such groups could travel around and give recommendations. Um, Professor Ramji, um, do you think artificial intelligence will have a role in uh, future uh, reduction in neonatal mortalities across the globe? I am not very sure. It it may uh, it may help uh, to some extent giving uh, such a help suggestions, but I because neo neonatal health is not uh, so easy to standardize and say everything is the same. So uh, yes, it may help to the extent that it may help uh, in technology. You may have an artificial intelligence which keeps adapting the way ventilators will work for preterms automatically. You don't need to worry, and it may decrease things like chronic lung disease and so on. But if you talk about neonatal mortality in general, where the problems are not technology driven, uh, I doubt if that's going to make a huge change. But but it may help in planning. If you have enough inputs coming in from various regions and say where the problems are, it may actually help policymakers and people at the state levels to say, okay, where is the problem happening? And can I pick them early enough and do something to solve the problem. So to that extent, at, at, the, at the more uh, larger level at the state or district, it may help uh, public health in identifying uh, pockets of problems and then say, can I, can I improve upon that? Thank you, sir. And thank you, Professor. Uh, uh, yes, uh, um, we have rightly pointed out that uh, yes, there are a lot of things which can be learned from our own country. Dr. Professor Ramji has said, because there is India is a vast country and then there is a lot of regional differences. We can look at uh, the states of Kerala where the neonatal mortality is really in single digit. And that's mm -hmm. purely because of the girl child education and girl care and freedom for choosing. And they have access to healthcare. And when you look at the Tamil Nadu model, education may not be so good, but access to healthcare is good. And uh, the other thing is uh, the Telangana model where uh, Arogishri was one of the first health scheme to come up in the state of Telangana. 
and this has significantly reduced the mortality in sick babies and also in mal malformations so mm -hmm. and if you move to the east again east has very good uh, models uh, especially the west bengal model where lot of uh, actually neonatal care is much better in the public sector there in the private sector mm -hmm. so there are a lot of good hospitals or medical colleges which are doing a uh, uh, good level 3 and level 2 care in the public uh, in the public sector and also the overall care in the level 1 level 2 is also improved because of the good education and again because of the probably because of uh, the care, care of the girl child i think we need to learn lesson from our own uh, state and also see what works for us and how we can catch up on uh, improving the neonatal mortality the big takeaways have been the ayushman bharat and the essentials so for the sick babies but i think at the same time politicians did make uh, some dent uh, i think in the last two decades a lot of things have changed uh, we are able to influence the politicians they are thinking in lines of improving the neonatal mortality and uh, people like dr ramji and dr paul sitting out there are helping in bringing in the right policies at the right time and i'm sure uh, in the, in the future we will be able to see single digit uh, nmr for uh, our newborns sir before uh, we close uh, there is one question which is uh, uh, repeatedly asked uh, can we suggest top five research priorities in india to reduce neonatal mortality you want my response you want yes, sir. Ola's response <laughs> both of yours uh, maybe dr ola professor ola's from the global perspective yeah. and maybe so from that's india that's from yours so, so yeah. i think i think there are uh, a couple of things uh, number one um, at the level of the uh, baby i think we need to address this issue of uh, preterm birth and growth restriction and stillbirths i think this is something we need to understand given the fact that one third of preterm births don't have a obvious reason and unless we address that is going to be a problem the challenge is how do you short fuse the time required to ensure that growth restriction does not happen transgenerationally uh, so i think this is an area and and one area which i would you know we have to go back to basic science uh, fetal growth is very much a basic science issue we don't even understand enough about the placenta so currently with the dbt and the transfer health sciences institute at delhi uh, we have as you know we have a huge preterm birth cohort which is trying to understand uh, what's going to why preterm births happen but as a part of the exercise we have also been able to stimulate a great deal of understanding and interest and research into the placenta and in fact dbt has funded a great deal of research to understand placenta in relation to preterm birth fetal growth restriction and things of that kind so i think this is one area uh, we should we should move and we i don't think we can move ahead a great deal without uh, linking with uh, basic uh, scientists I and mean, cl clinicians can't work and and you know ola is a great example of our clinician uh, also merged into becoming a, a basic scientist asking those fundamental questions the second the second area uh, to me is to look at what happens to our kids after they go home you know we have invested a great deal essentials but i think we need to understand what makes people behave the way they do so understanding community behavior to understand how they take up uh, advice challenges that we give is, is is another area and the last is i think a larger area of looking at what works best or what has worked best in a certain region to bring down mortality you know it's a let's say it's a well, we need a little larger perspective to understand as as ola said i mean india has many countries so there could be different things that have worked at different places and so i think that understanding is important for us and then using that information which we fed as i said to somebody suggested to ai maybe a way for us to look at how ai is can be utilized in fact dbt currently i chair a, i chair a, a committee funded by the uh, gates foundation uh, where uh, we have invited people to look at large data sets big data and use ai to figure out what happens in terms of infant mortality so so i think that these are many areas but i think important for all of us is that we need to have multi domain skills we just can't be clinicians we must have skills 
either in public health or in economics or in sociology or in uh, you know basic science all this needs to be built in we have to think you know uh, across all this if we eventually have to make a big dent so that's my take that i think we just have to move away from the usual paradigm of of looking at a clinical problem and finding solutions but i think we need to go beyond that if yeah. really we need to solve thank you so much sir and thank you professor ola uh, i think this has been a wonderful uh, session for uh, stimulating young minds to ensure that they also look beyond the clinical perspective because there are a lot of things which are beyond our control but i think we do play important role in influencing people who have control so on behalf of uh, telangana state nnf and also ankura hospitals i thank uh, vijay raghavan for organizing this important uh, webinar and uh, professor ola thank you for sparing your wonderful time here and uh, thank you dr ramji uh, looking forward for more of these associations thank you so much thank you thank you thank you goodbye bye bye hope to see you soon